Now we're going to start to look at calculating or analyzing solutions to the hydrogen atom to determine properties of the orbitals that we are typically used to. But to do that, we have to start operating again in three-dimensional space, and we have to integrate three-dimensional integrals. Up until this point, we've been using one-dimensional integrals, and this has served us very well because a lot of times the problems didn't have to be more complicated than this. This was particle-in-a-box problems or problems that have to do with the harmonic oscillator, where we could say that the probability of the particle being somewhere or being between x and x plus dx is equal to psi star psi times dx, which means that the probability of finding the particle in some little tiny region is equal to those two terms multiplied by each other. If we extrapolate this to 3D space, then all that means is that instead of it just being a linear element, in that case dx, then we just multiply psi star psi times a volume element. In this case, I'll just call it dv. And if we do this on Cartesian, then that would just simply be the volume of a little tiny box where I have the x component being dx, the y component being dy, and the z component being dz. So that means then if I were to do this in Cartesian space, I would say psi star psi dx dy and dz. If I were to do this in spherical coordinates, which is what we're going to do since all of our orbitals are spherically symmetrical, then first what we need to do is we need to just understand how we calculate sector lengths. And so if I have basically an arc, and I want to draw the line that joins these two, these two radiuses, which are going to be the same. And in this case, this is an arc that's sort of part of a circle. If I want to know what this arc length is, that's just the radius of the circle times theta, where theta is written in radians. And so you can imagine that if theta is equal to 2 pi, meaning that we're going to calculate the arc length that goes all the way around a circle, then we know that the circumference of the circle is going to be equal to 2 pi times r, which follows exactly what we have written in terms of the length of our arc length, because r is still the same and theta is 2 pi, meaning I've gone all the way around. But if I only want to know just a little tiny piece of that, then it's just basically going to be just this the angle theta times r. And so you can imagine that if we're going to look at just a very, very, very small slice, a very, very small piece of theta, just like we did here with these small pieces of length, the dx, dy, dz, then that means then this little sector length in terms of when we start calculating areas and volumes is going to be r times d theta, or this radius times a little tiny piece, this d theta. Now I'm belaboring this point a little bit just so that now that I'm showing you this image of how we come up with a volume element in a spherical coordinate basis, so that hopefully this makes a little bit more sense as to where some of these terms come from. Now right away, one of these dimensions for this little tiny volume element, which is this piece right here that I'm highlighting, right away is, should be fairly accessible because of this dr term which is this term that I'm circling, is basically the, the width of this volume element that we're going to be calculating. And that's basically could be associated, or you can think of it just like as, this, as the dx, dy, or dz term. It's basically as we move from one radius to a small little piece of radius next to it, then there's going to be a distance dr, a very infinitesimally small unit that represents that, that length. These other two lengths, however, they have to do with being sectors of a piece of a circle, where the arc length is going to be very, very, very small, or the angle is going to be very, very, very small. And so one example of this is this term, this r d theta, where if we look into this big picture here, we have the d theta term, which is the angle that is being subtended by the, this, this volume element, and that the radius of this circle that was related to it is just r. So therefore, the, the depth of this arc element, or this volume element, is just r times d theta, which is analogous to exactly what we were talking about a second ago when I had this written on a sphere. This last element, this r sine theta d phi, 
This last term where that comes from is that the radius of the circle that represents that piece of the arc is r times sine theta. And this comes from using a trig identity to be able to define basically this length from the z-axis coming out to the volume element itself. And that the angle that's subtended by this little piece of volume element, well, that, that angle is just d phi. So in this case, if we move this back to this analogous, r times theta is equal to the length of the, the sect of the circle. Well, in this case, that radius is r sine theta, and the angle in this case is d phi. What this means in the end is that in a spherical basis set, the volume element is going to be the multiplication of these three terms. And so what I end up with is r squared sine theta d r d theta d phi. And again, that's just the multiplication of these three terms so that we basically get the volume of this tiny element that we have here. And that's no different than what we did in Cartesian where we just multiply the length times the width times the height. Here we're just multiplying length times width times height. And we end up with this r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. And so that means then if we were to do an integral with this volume element, like let's say we were going to normalize something, then we would say, well, the probability of finding the particle somewhere in all space is equal to 1, meaning it's certain. And we're going to do an integral between 0 and infinity, 0 and pi, and 0 and 2 pi times psi star psi times r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. And again, all of this piece, this, this secondary piece here, this r squared sine theta dr d theta d, pi, d phi, that's just our volume element. Now these bounds of these integrals, where they came from, are basically the bounds for our system. So our radius, if we're talking about all space, well, that goes from a radius of 0, being we're at the origin, all the way out to infinity, and that would be all space. And I can't search to negative infinity because there's no, there's, there's, it doesn't make any sense to have a radius that's less than 0. A radius is defined as being the smallest it can be is at 0. Where the bounds of these two other integrals being the 0 to pi and the 0 to 2 pi, that comes from the idea that phi runs from 0 to 2 pi, and theta runs from 0 to pi. So they're basically just the bounds on the angles imposed by our three-dimensional system that we have in our, that we use as our basis set for these angles. And while we do some of these examples, these bounds will change depending upon what exactly we're looking at. But if we're talking about the full spectrum of all of space, then these would be the bounds of the integrals that we would be using to do the calculations that we're going to look next at.